Okay. Right, I guess we should get going. So um, thank you, everybody, for coming. I'm delighted to introduce Dieter Steinhilber from Frankfurt today. Um, and just by way of introduction, um, Dieter's going to talk, his talk is entitled Canonical and Non-Canonical Functions of Human 5 lab Oxygenase. My name is Valerie O'Donnell. I'm based at Cardiff University in the UK. As usual, our webinar is being recorded and it will be uploaded onto the Lipid Maps YouTube uh, channel uh, within the next two days. It's going to be around 45 minutes, allowing 10 minutes at the end for questions. And what I'd like to encourage is for everybody, if you have a question during the talk, post it in the chat or in the Q&A. And that means that when we come to the end, I can pick it up and unmute you so you can ask the question yourself. So ideally be posting them in the chat because we'll take them in the order that they come in. So I'd now like to introduce our speaker. Uh, Professor Dr. Dieter Steinhilber studied pharmacy at the University of Tübingen. Uh, after an assistantship there, he spent a postdoc period with Bengt Samuelsson at the Karolinska Institute in Stockholm. In 1994, he became associate professor, and since 2000, he's been a professor in pharmaceutical chemistry at the Johann Wolfgang Goethe University in Frankfurt am Main. Uh, Dieter has chaired the European Graduate Programme's roles of Icosanoids in Biology and Medicine and the Elsie Kroner Fresenius Graduate Programme, which are joint initiatives from Goethe University and the Karolinska. He's been president of the German Pharmaceutical Society and the European Federation for Pharmaceutical Sciences. His research is supported by Deutsche Forschungsgemeinschaft, and he's published more than 300 papers in peer-reviewed scientific journals. Dieter's research focuses on lipid signaling mechanisms in inflammation and cancer and development of new therapeutic strategies with a special focus on the arachidonic cascade. And specifically, I guess, mainly, that's 5-lipoxygenase, uh, which catalyzes the transformation of arachidonic acid to leukotriene A4, which is then converted to LTB4 and C4 by various enzymes. These are lipids that are critically important in host defense and in numerous inflammatory diseases. And Dieter's work focuses on the cell biology and the biochemistry of this pathway um, in granular sites, in particular, how it might be harnessed for development of anti-inflammatory drugs. Um, he's also researching non-canonical roles for 5-lipoxygenase, as he says in the title, um, and I guess one example is a recent paper which showed how 5-LOX regulates transcription by a direct association with U-chromatin in monocytic cells. And, and this sounds really fascinating work. I'm really looking forward to hearing more about um, the, the fascinating biology of this protein and how it mediates its unique actions. So thank you, Dieter, for coming today, and we look forward to hearing your talk. So I'm going to hand over to you now. Yeah, Valerie, thanks a lot for your kind introduction. And it's a pleasure to present some of our recent work around 5 lipoxygenase. And uh, probably most of you know that uh, the pathway was discovered uh, uh, more than 40 years ago in Bengt Samuelson's lab. And here you, you, you see in principle what the enzyme is doing. So since it's called 5 lipoxygenase, it uh, introduces oxygen at C5 and then uh, this leads to generation of, of a variety of products. And here are some of them. That's 5 feed, that's leukotriene B4 or the system leukotrienes. So to summarize uh, many uh, papers which were published in the in the last decades, it's that 5 lipoxygenase uh, generates mediators of inflammatory and allergic diseases. The 5 lipoxygenase pathway is part of the innate immune system. It was shown that it stimulates antibody production by B cells. And 5-lipoxygenase uh, was shown to be involved in the onset as well as the resolution of inflammation. But also there seems to be a link between 5-lipoxygenase and the development of uh, certain uh, types of, of cancer. So due to the role of 5-lipoxygenase um, in the immune system, the expression of 5-lipoxygenase is mainly restricted to leukocytes. So you find 5 low expression in granulocytes, all types of granulocytes, biosophils, eosinophils, neutrophils. You find 5-lipoxygenase in monocytes, macrophages, and in B cells, whereas T cells are mostly 5 alone negative, as you can see also here in in this figure derived from the human protein atlas. So erythrocytes and platelets, they're uh, 5 0 negative. So the main uh, expression of 5 0 is uh, within immune cells uh, uh, that are um, leukocytes. And uh, what I will talk uh, to you today, uh, there are two fields which we're, we were working on uh, during the last years. 
first of all, uh, the catalytic activity. So I will show uh, you some data on the canonical function. That's the conversion of polyunsaturated fatty acids to bioactive molecules. And uh, then uh, I will focus on 5 low as a regulator of transcription. For time reason, I would uh, not go into that one because it was shown later uh, before by, by Ben Samuels lab that 5 low interacts with diacer and also can affect microRNA process. So let's start with the 5 lipoxygenase as regulator of, of transcription. And this cartoon here summarizes the location of 5 low and its activation. And uh, in, in leukocytes, so in, in most of the cells, 5 lipoxygenase is localized or in, in the cytosol. It can be activated by calcium, but also by kinases to translocate to the nuclear membrane where uh, leukotriene biosynthesis occurs. There it interacts with FLAP. FLAP provides arachidonic acid for a conver conversion of 5 low. Uh, by 5 low to leukotrienes. But uh, what was observed uh, uh, many years ago that 5 lipoxygenase uh, not only translocate to the nuclear envelope to generate leukotrienes, but it also can translocate to the nucleus where it associates with euchromatin, uh, where it regu can regulate obviously transcription, but the function of that uh, was largely unknown. Um, so, uh, 5 lipoxidase is a rather mobile enzyme, and uh, uh, this has to do with uh, uh, the fact that there are several uh, nuclear localization sequences here within the 5 low protein and also nuclear export sequence, which regulate the location of, of the 5 lipoxidase. And uh, it, it was found here that, uh, for example, 5 lipoxygenase can't be phosphorylated at serine 523. So then you mask uh, um, uh, this uh, nuclear localization site, which uh, leads to the situation that 5 lipoxygenase uh, remains in the cytosol. And that was uh, uh, shown many years ago uh, via phosphorylation by PKA. And then it, uh, also, uh, uh, MK2 can phosphorylate um, 5 lipoxygenase serine 271, uh, and there with that one, it masks a nuclear export sequence. So, um, phosphorylation of 5 lipoxygenase by uh, uh, the P38 MAP kinase activation pathway here prevents nuclear export. But uh, Although it's now now what inhibits nuclear import and what inhibits nuclear export, the signal that induces nuclear import by 5 low is unknown at the moment. So um, then if, if, we, if we look at the function of 5 lipoxygenase, I mean, 5 lipoxygenase was mostly associated with, with uh, uh, allergy and uh, and inflammation, but there was a very interesting report in the literature um, many years ago, um, where it was found that if you knock out the five allow um, in a PCR able model of leukemia formation, it leads to uh, uh, chronic myeloid leukemia. You com completely prevent. Uh, 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 the formation of, of leukemia if you knock out the 5 lipoxygenase. And it was shown in that paper that the deficiency of the 5 lipoxygenase gene that causes impairment of the function of leukemic stem cells. So uh, this was a, a very interesting finding. And uh, there were several hypotheses at uh, that time, how that could happen. So one hypothesis were, was that 5 allow is in a way downstream of the pcr able kinase and then leads to aberrant activation of beta catenine. So we became in, interested in that. And uh, in Frankfurt at the University Hospital, we had a group with Martin Ruthard working on leukemia, but he was working on a different model together uh, with Thorsten Meyer. And they were uh, using a, the pml ra alpha uh, model, which also leads to, to leukemia. And a hallmark of both models is that you get 
wind signal activation, which leads then to all the gene expression profile. You get increased self-renewal of the cells and increased proliferation, but you uh, reduce differentiation and, and apoptosis. So uh, how does wind signaling work? So if you have inactive wind signaling, you have a continuous phosphorylation of beta-catenin, beta -catenin, and then this beta-catenin is degraded by uh, proteasomes uh, um, so that there's uh, uh, no accumulation of beta-catenin. But then if you have the wind lag and, uh, and activation of the, of the receptor here, this uh, phosphorylation is abrogated, you get accumulation of beta-catenin, translocation of beta-catenin into the nucleus and activate uh, activation of wind target genes and here are two examples of wind target genes are CIMIC for example and cyclin D1 so you get promotion of uh, the cell cycle so uh, cell division and cell renewal so uh, one student of, of us uh, she, she was working with us with that PML Ra alpha model was Jessica Rose. And what she was doing is that she uh, made a retroviral transfection of bone marrow cells from, from mice with a PML uh, Ra alpha uh, oncogene. And then um, the cells were grown for seven days in the presence of a 5 alo inhibitor. That was the CJ compound. And then uh, the cells were inoculated into lethally irradiated mice and uh, then um, uh, colony formation was used, uh, was, was analyzed in the spleen. And what you can see here is that, uh, I mean, the count compound was not doing so much in the control uh, mice. You get a slight uh, induction of colony uh, in the colony numbers. But if you look at the uh, PML Ra alpha model here, you get a strong inhibition of colony formation when you add it here, the CJ compound, this, this 5 alo inhibitor. And if you look at the morphology of the spleen, here you can see that uh, the drug could normalize here uh, the morphology of the spleen. Uh, so it got uh, almost no normal uh, size. And um, we had a, several years before we had a look at the at the compound. So it, it's quite effective inhibitor of five lipoxinase. It's a competitive inhibitor. And but when you looked at the cell homogenate, the 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 inhibitor showed an interesting behavior because uh, it was not active in the cell homogenates. But if you add DDT to to uh, decrease the peroxide tonus here, you get also a nice inhibition of 5 alo So it belongs to, to these kind of class of 5 lipoxinase inhibitor, which are peroxidase dependent, showing they're only effective if you have a, a low um, concentration of peroxides. So what, what happens with wind in, in this model? So we uh, next, we, we had a, a look at uh, uh, better catenin and what you can see here is if you if you uh, uh, stay in that for better catenin in the PML Ra alpha model here you get an increased expression of better catenin which was reduced again with the CJ compound and uh, then Jessica had a look at the cellular look localization of 5 lipoxidase and uh, beta catenin and uh, what became obvious is that both 5 lipoxidase and uh, beta catenin they are located at the nuclear membrane thus preventing the entry of beta catenin into the nucleus and the, thus and that's a reported gene assay thus preventing activation of uh, wind dependent uh, transcription. So uh, that was published by our group. And, and a bit later, um, Herbert Waldmann at, at the Max Planck Institute in Dortmund, they were screening for wind inhibitors. Uh, they screened around 10,000 compounds uh, for wind inhibition. And finally, they identified lipoxygenin as, as a wind inhibitor, but um, they realized that this compound does not bind 
to better catenine. So they were interested in looking at the targets of, of, of that compound. So they uh, um, made an affinity-based target ID so that the compound was immobilized and they were, were screening for binding protein. And one protein which showed up was arachidonic acid, uh, donate five lipoxygenase. And indeed it was a five lipoxygenase inhibitor. And uh, then they were looking at other developmental pathway and it was sh they could show that it also blocks um, TGF beta pathway and, and related pathway. So obviously it has a quite broad spectrum in, in inhibition of this developmental pathway. So this was, um, the second hint that there's an association between 5 lipoxidase and beta catenine signaling. So using proximity ligation assays, they could show that uh, there's a co-localization of 5 alo and beta catenine. And uh, also uh, what they found is if you stimulate cells with wind here and that they did with uh, U2OS cells, they express uh, rather a lot of the 5 lipoxygenase. You get translocation of the 5 lipoxygenase from the cytosol to the nucleus. And when you add the, the, this lipoxygenine, you can inhibit this translocation into the nucleus. So data which fit very well with our observation that uh, in a way 5 lipoxygenase regulates translocation of uh, uh, wind. So uh, what could be the conclusion out of that? So obviously um, five allow can uh, either directly or indirectly here uh, bind to, to better catenine containing complexes. And uh, obviously it's involved in shuttling of uh, the beta catenine from the cytosol into the nucleus. And here one has to consider that beta catenine itself has no nuclear localization sequences. So it relies on other proteins, probably uh, as 5 to to shuttle the transcription factor from the cytosol to the nucleus. If you then add a 5 inhibitor, you get accumulation uh, of beta catenine at the nuclear membrane and prevent um, entry of the of the nucleus and transcriptional uh, activation. So uh, our hypothesis is now that uh, well you have of course this canonical function of leukotriene biosynthesis which is well known which plays a role in immunity and inflammation but then you, you obviously have a non-canonical function of 5 alo where it interacts with transcription factors and it's involved in the regulation of gene expression and if you look at wind uh, i mean it's transcription uh, wind signaling it's a, a pathway which is involved in tissue cell regeneration so obviously uh, this could be related to the fact that if you have uh, immune uh, response for example if you uh, in the defense of bacterial infection then you have a second phase where you have tissue repair and uh, that could be related to that one so uh, yeah obviously the 5 alo can regulate transcription factors and here a short summary of of other reports which uh, highlight or hint uh, give hints to to this um, uh, hypothesis. So uh, it was shown before by the group of uh, Mark Peters Gold that 5 alo is located in the eugromatin, as I already mentioned. Then there was another interesting report by Mario Romano's group uh, showing that 5 alo antagonizes uh, P53 transcriptional activity by affecting his, his nuclear trafficking. So it also fits to our uh, observation in a way. And then, of course, uh, the beta canonine story, which I present today. So uh, we became interested in which kind of genes could be regulated by the firefly poxinase. And for that purpose, we used the human monocytic cell line monomark 6. There we did the firefly poxinase knockout uh, with a CRISPR-Cas system. And then we did again a firefly poxinase knock-in. And then we... Uh, made different treatments. So we left the cells undifferentiated or differentiated with them with TGF beta, calcitriol. And then for the last six hours of the differentiation, we stimulated them with LPS. And then we did RNA-seq and uh, 
to, to analyze the uh, differential gene expression. And uh, what came out of this uh, analysis was that many genes are regulated, which uh, are involved in cytokine or immune responses, what you can see here. If you look at these clusters shown in, in, in blue here, they're all related uh, with the regulation of immune processes. But also you get genes which are involved in the regulation of uh, population proliferation, or, and it was uh, also interested, uh, interesting and in, uh, evolved in regulation of uh, leukocyte cell adhesion. And uh, if you're interested in these data, uh, you can retrieve them there. We, we, we put them into the uh, geo database. So these are the data sets, uh, uh, genome-wide data sets. And um, I would like to, I show you two examples of 5 uh, 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 regulated genes. So for one example is the Kaidu or the Kaidu reninase here. And as you can see that we found a very strong regulation by 5 lipoxygenase. And here you, you, key the, you can see the RT-PCR data for, for the Kuno reninase here. Um, it's a gene which is strongly induced by LPS. And when you knock out 5 lipoxygenase, this response to LPS is completely suppressed. And if you do the knock-in again, you can restore the induction, both in, undifer uh, in undifferentiated cells and also in the differentiated cells. So what is uh, quinorenase doing? Um, quinorenase uh, here uh, degrades quinorenin here to anthranilic acid or uh, three hydroxyquinorinane to to three hydroxyantranilic acid. So um, then, if you if you have an upregulation of uh, the enzyme here, you get a decrease in quinorinine. And uh, one has to know that quinorinine uh, is is a um, immunosuppressant. It's a ligand for the real hydrocarbon uh, receptor, and there it mediating um, regulation of immune function. So what is 5 lipoxygenase is doing? So it, it leads, it uses degradation of uh, this immunosuppressant. Uh, so you get an immune stimulating activity. And indeed, when you when we analyze here this metabolite, you can see in the presence of 5 lipoxygenase you get uh, metabolism of the quinorenine here to the three hydroxy anthranilic acid. If you knock out five below, the metabolism is uh, uh, is gone. And if you re-express the five lipoxygenase, you can restore this uh, activation. Another cheat, which is a five lipoxygenase response gene, and it was very interesting, it's COX-2. So we identified COX-2, but there the five lipoxygenase effects were opposite. So in it does not support the upregulation of COX-2, but uh, ALOX-5, the 5 lipoxidase protein, inhibits COX-2 expression. And that you can see here. So we treated the cells with LPS. You see the LPS mediated induction of COX-2. And then if you knock out the 5 lipoxidase, you get a stronger LPS response here in undifferentiated cells, here in differentiated cells. And if you re-express the 5 lipoxygenase, then COX-2 induction is um, inhibited again. So uh, we have an inverse regulation um, by 5 lipoxygenase. So the next question we ask ourselves, do you need 5 lipoxygenase activity or the 5 low protein? So to, to address this question, we did a second knock-in, and the knock-in is a catalytically inactive mutant. And um, the, the, the effects you can see here, for example, if you if you go for uh, quinorenase here, it's like that, that the control cells uh, have um, uh, activity one. If you do the knockout, you get a very strong reduction of uh, um, uh, expression of the enzyme. If you do the knock-in, you can restore it. But also, if you do the knock-in with a catalytically inactive mutant, you can completely restore the activity. 
with a uh, with a CDA eleven B, that's it. Game here, uh, the results are not so clear, but uh, also because you only see a strong effect, uh, a weak effect uh, by the five lipoxygenase knockout, you get a, a slight increase in, in ITGAM expression. If you do the knock-in, uh, you, you get inhibition, but uh, also with the inactive mutant, you can normalize that uh, to the control. One has to consider uh, this data is that the expression level is somewhat different. So here you see the expression of the uh, five lipoxygenase in the different differentiated wild type cells. So the knock-in expression is stronger, but uh, then the mutant is is uh, uh, weaker expressed here. So the different responses between the knock-in and, and, the, and the mutant could be due to the different protein level. But uh, yeah, if you look at COX-2, you get uh, around fourfold, uh, induction by the knockout. If you do the knock-in, you get complete suppression of COX-2 induction, but also uh, with a with a catalytic inactive mutant, you get similar uh, levels, similar results compared to the wild-type enzyme. So obviously for most of uh, these effects, you don't need catalytically active 5 0 so you just need the protein. Um, Another set of genes which was regulated was, were, were, were genes which are involved in uh, cell adhesion. So we also checked the effect of the 5 0 knockout on cell adhesion to activate endothelial cells. And the effect you can see here, uh, if you compare wild type with the 5 0 knockout, you get increased adhesion of the monomark 6 cells here. Um, to the endothelial cells. And if you do the knock in again, you can reverse this phenotype. So the question was uh, then, of course, is that uh, an indirect effect or does 5 0 really uh, is recruited um, into uh, these uh, transcriptionally uh, regulatory sites? So for, for that one, we did a series of experiments. First of all, we did the fair seek analysis. This is a method just to, to uh, have a look at um, gene locations where you have open chromatin. And that you can see here, so, so you get peaks here um, when you have open chromatin. So this is for quinorenidase in that case. So if you look at the wild type uh, 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 cells here, you, 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 which are stimulated by LPS, you, you have open chromatin in the quinorenidase promoter. But if you do the knockout here, uh, the, five below, uh, the the promoter of the quinorenase is much more closed. And then we were interested in whether 5 below is really recruited to that side. And, and, and for that one, we did a, a cheap seek experiment with 5 below. So we used the 5 below antibody and isolated DNA fragments uh, with, with this method, which are uh, uh, associated with 5 below protein with a, with a cheap seek experiment. And indeed, what we observed is that uh, five lipoxygenase protein seems to be uh, here in this region. And when we looked at the histone markers, uh, we saw in many genes that this location of 5 0 signals here, uh, they are co localized with the histone 3 uh, lysine 27 acetylation. Uh, signal, and this is a, a marker usually for active enhancers. So, um, 5 0 seems to co localize in many sites with, with that signal. And then we, did, we had a look at the uh, at, uh, at COX 2 here, and that you can see here. Um, there, if you look at the open chromatin, it's like that. If you do the knockout, you get uh, an opening of the chromatin around the COX-2 promoter. And also you, you saw some 5 0 chip uh, signals here in that region. And that's the region again, which co-localizes with the histone 3 lysine 27 uh, acetylation. So you, since of course you, with this method, you, you get uh, genome-wide data. So we did the genome-wide analysis. Where really, where can we find 5 lipoxygenase uh, throughout the genes. And uh, first of all, here in green, you see the fair signal, which completely uh, uh, 
correlate with the transcriptional start side where you have open chromatin, but then adjacent to this chromat uh, to this transcriptional start sites, you, you have the firefly poxinase uh, signals here, regardless whether you have unstimulated cells or cells stimulated with LPS here. And here you see a nice correlation uh, between the firefly poxinase signal and uh, the histone 3 lies in 27 acetylation signal. So uh, then, of course, uh, if you have this ChIP-seq data set, you can uh, have a look at which other signals co-localize with 5 allow. And as already um, shown that are uh, this uh, histone 3 lies in 27 acetylation signal, but also other acetylation signal here have some overlaps up to 40% here uh, with five lipoxinase. But also you can do that with transcription factors or other uh, uh, nuclear proteins. And uh, we also find a quite nice correlation with the RBFOX2 transcription factors or the promo domain protein BRT2, BRT4, and so on. So on. So uh, and also here with the uh, KM22A and that's MLL here. And we know that MLL itself again regulates FIFLO expression. So to so to sum that up, where is FIFLO located? So it's it's uh, located adjacent to um, the transcriptional start sites uh, according to our ChIP-seq analysis. Um, and uh, this is adjacent to the peak of open chromatin. And here you see the location of the other uh, markers, which I just showed you right now. So uh, obviously here, five lipoxidase can um, interact with transcription factors and plays a role in the transcriptional regulation of genes which are involved in uh, the regulation of immune responses. So in the second part of my talk today, I will uh, focus on the canonical functions and the formation of leukotrienes and the specialized pro-resolving lipid mediators. And as probably all of you know, uh, the uh, active concept is that 5 lipoxidase is involved in the generation of pro-inflammatory mediators such as leukotriene B4, which, uh, uh, which is in, involved in immune reaction and inflammation. But then uh, that you have a lipid mediator switch here uh, and the 5 allow is involved in the generation of specialized pro-resolving lipid mediators. And this is associated with a change in the expression profile of lipoxinases. So if you compare M1 cells with M2 cells, it's like that, that M1 cells uh, primarily express 5 lipoxinase, whereas M2 cells express 5 lipoxinase as well as uh, 15 lipoxinase. So an, a hallmark of this SPF formation, at least uh, if 5 lipoxinase is involved, is uh, that you have the consecutive action of two lipoxinases, the 5 allow and the 12 15 allow. So we have two options. First of all, we have a generation of oxylipids by 5 allow, which are then taken as substrate by the 12 and 15 allow um, to generate SPMs. And this pathway here is marked in green throughout my presentation. And then you have uh, the other, uh, the opposite uh, uh, opportunity that you have first 12, 15 low activity, and then the generated oxylipids are taken as substrate by the 5 allow to generate the, the SPMs. And here you see this pathway, which uh, involved in uh, uh, by the, the transformation of arachidonic acid, icosapendinoic acid, and uh, docosahexaenoic acid, for example, here then leading to the resolving D series. So um, we ask ourselves uh, is uh, if you look at the 12, 15 allo, 5 allo pathway, and that's the pathway which is usually suggested to be involved in the generation of SPMs. Here, there you have 
generation of 15 HP or 17 HDHA. And this intermediates there then uh, used a substrate by the five lipoxygenase here to generate the, the SPMs. And we ask our question, can human five lipoxygenase utilize these oxylipids as substrate? And for that one, uh, we incubated purified human 5 lipoxygenase with arachidonic acid or 15 heat or 70 SHDHA um, and uh, then for 15 minutes and check the products. And that was done uh, by uh, our collaborator here at the University of Wuppertal by Niels Helge Schepp. And what you can see here is if you have arachidonic acid, you get 5 heat, and, but also uh, a lot of uh, six trans isomers of LTB4, so it's nicely accepted as substrate. But if you add the uh, same amounts of 15 heat, you can see, well, it's it's not very well accepted as substrate, but you you get a formation of 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 uh, 15 uh, 5s 50s di heat. But if you lose you lose the same scale, you don't see anything. So we scaled it up by 200 fold, and then you see some Alex A4. If you go for a 17 s HDHA, we did not find any any uh, products or any resolvents generated by that. So um, our conclusion was, well, 5 alo hardly converts these oxylipines uh, and the, especially the trihydroxylated oxylipines are formed at very low amounts by purified human 5 lipoxidase. So then we had a look, look at the literature and but yeah, what we found is uh, that was mainly um, mainly data reported by Ted uh, Holman's group that they found the same that so these oxylipines here, they're um, not very uh, good substrates for the five lipoxygenase. Um, so uh, I think if you look at our data and Ted Holman's data um, and other data with purified five alone, one can really conclude that uh, five lipoxygenase hardly uses uh, these oxylipines as a substrate. So, uh, but when you look at the literature, there are two very nice old reports. Um, one was a group of Peter Hansen and the other one uh, from uh, Dennis uh, um, Riondo at, at Mark Frost. They, they found that, well, I mean, five lipoxygenase can really convert oxylipins like 12 heat or, or, or 15 heat if flap is around. So the concept is that 15 heat is taken up then by the cells. It is currently unknown whether it's esterified and then released by phospholipase A2 to be presented by FLAP or FLAP can directly present 15 heat to, to 5 allow. But then obviously 5 lipoxygenase is, is, um, is able to use these substrates. So uh, we had a look then at neutrophils as a, as a source for 5 lipoxygenase and uh, we added then um, the, the oxylipine substrate to mimic transcellular formation of uh, uh, SPMs, which involve a 15 LO positive cell and uh, the neutrophil. So that we, we added uh, these, these oxylipines and incubated the neutrophils and did uh, stimulation of the 5 lipoxygenase, maximum stimulation of 5 lipoxygenase by. Uh, calcium ionophore, and then was then Niels was looking at the formed oxylipines. And what you can see here is that uh, you, you get formation of the dihydroxylated uh, intermediates, the diheats, or also resolving D5, which is a dihydroxylated um, uh, product, but uh, the formation of this trihydroxylated uh, lipoxin was very low. So you scale up, then you see some LXA4 or uh, some LXB4 under these conditions. But here you have to see that you have a, a, a high concentrate, rather high concentration of, of uh, oxylipin substrate. So uh, the conclusion was, well, you, 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 eas you can easily detect the dihydroxylated uh, um, oxylipines here 
that's uh, 5s, 15s diheat, resolving D5, or here uh, resolving uh, E2, for example. But uh, at, at the end, I mean, you have a very low formation of the trihydroxylate. Uh, uh, trihydroxyl oxalipin and here if yeah if you look at the scale here also the utilization of 18 heap as a substrate is 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 rather low uh, but of course i mean we we observed uh, uh, always uh, resolving d5 formation and the 5s 15s diheat so we were comparing different stimuli and that was quite interesting because if you looked at the 5s 15s diheat sphingosine 1 phosphate is a a very prominent inducer of the formation of that one. It's even more potent than ionophore. But if you look at the resolving D5, uh, you get a different pattern. So there, ionophore was a much better uh, stimuli to for, for resolving D5 uh, generation. So, uh, but uh, then we were, became interested then look at the uh, SPM formation and macrophages, because there we don't have the, the problem that there's only expression of one lipoxygenase, namely the five lipoxygenase. But if you go for the monocyte to uh, macrophage differentiation, at least if you go to M2, like macrophages, in principle, they possess all the enzymes um, evolved in uh, SPM formation. So if you differentiate them, stimulate them with, with LPS, they are rich in 5-lipoxygenase. They have a 15-LO1 expression, also 15-LO2 expression. So with those cells, in, in principle, we don't have to care about whether they have the 5-LO, 15-LO pathway or the reverse one, the 12-15-LO and the 5-LO pathway. I mean, they should be able to uh, synthesize SPMs as uh, shown in my initial slide that you have this uh, um, uh, oxylipine sh shift during, during uh, differentiation. So if, if you look at the pathway itself, um, and if you look at the 5 to 12, 12 to 15 low pathway, it's like that, that here you have the 5 low which generates LTA4 and we know from our experiments where we mix platelets and neutrophils that this is a rather good substrate for for the 12 allow to generate lipoxids. So if you if you mix platelets and, and leukocytes, you get quite prominent lipoxin A4 formation. So in, in principle, this pathway uh, works quite well if you think about the catalytic activities of, of uh, the lipoxinases. If you take the opposite way that you have, first of all, generation of 12, uh, 15 allo products by, by this enzyme, and then the conversion of these oxylipins by 5 allo, it's a bit different what you what we, we learned from our neutrophil experiments. Um, obviously, this does not work very well because the heats or the, the oxylipins are not very good substrates. And then to generate, uh, uh, these trihydroxylated SPMs, which are uh, uh, shown here, you get you, you need formation of the epoxide by the 5 lipoxygenase. Um, so this epoxide formation by 5 allo is is required then for all of of uh, these trihydroxylated SPMs. If we think about this pathway. So uh, yeah, what, what happened uh, then? Uh, so we did differentiation of uh, the monocytes, human monocytes, two M1 and M2 like cells. It's a seven days um, a differentiation procedure, and uh, in, in part uh, we we stimulated the cells for the last sixteen hours by LPS or cymosan. Then we harvested the cells and and. Uh, did a maximum stimulation of 5 lipoxygenase in the presence of substrates for uh, SPM formation. And then Niels was doing the LCMS analysis. So if you, and then we, did, we analyzed M1 cells, M2 cells, um, then unstimulated, then stimulated with LPS. And also we mixed M1 and M2 cells to see whether maybe you, you get a different pattern. And what we saw is, of course, I mean, when you 
when, when, uh, with the M1 cells, you see LTP4, you see a, a lot of five, five heat. Um, but if you look at the dihydroxylated uh, metabolites here, you get much less. You, you have to scale up by 38 fold. You, you get a, about the same signals. But then if you if you look at LXA4, I mean, in, in most of, of um, incubation, we did not see any LXA4. Uh, so we only found minute amounts of LXA4 here uh, in the M2 cells, which were stimulated by, by LPS then. And uh, so uh, it became clear that uh, at least the formation of the trihydroxylate SPMs uh, in the M1, uh, in, in the M2 macrophages is extremely low. So we, we had a uh, same uh, look at the uh, EPA derivatives. And here you see the some uh, formation of the resolve in E2, but also, uh, I mean, this is scaled uh, up by 600 fold, but the other resolvings uh, of the E series, they are very low. And the same picture we observed with the DHA derivatives, you get uh, quite prominent formation of the monohydroxylated derivatives. Um, you always observed resolving D5, that's the dihydroxylated derivative. But again, when we looked at the other one here, you get extremely low formation of the resolvents, if, if at all, uh, here. So uh, the next thing we did, okay, we did not find so so much of that one. Are we the only one? And what you can see here is that's a summary of uh, several reports from different groups which were investigating uh, SPM formation in M1 and M2 like cells. You, you see that here. You see the, the differentiation conditions here, then whether the cells were stimulated or uh, uh, or not here, and then uh, whether cells and supernatant was analyzed or only the supernatant. And uh, regardless what, what the people were, were doing uh, here, in principle, the amounts of the trihydroxylated SPMs was undetectable here or very low. Here, at least our study, you found most of them at very low levels, but if you do not really explicitly add the, the, the substrate, so we, we, we added here uh, arachidonic acid, EPA and DHA here to, to, to yield some, but in, in most of the other studies, you don't find any, any SPMs. Um, um, this is uh, the paper by the Karolinska Institute. These are three papers by the Oliver Wertz uh, group here, and that's uh, uh, one paper here from uh, University of, of uh, Salzburg by Andreas Köbele here. So uh, in principle, you get the same, um, same picture in all this uh, human uh, macrophage study. And um, the, the trihydroxylated SPM, which is at, at least detectable in, in, in most cases, that's the LXA4. But also if, if you have a look at, at uh, uh, those, and if you look have a look at, at the precursor, here you get uh, a strong uh, difference uh, in the amounts which are released by the precursor and by the LXA4 itself. So if you look at other stuff, other we, we have a, a, a 25, uh, uh, 2,500 fold higher formation of 515 heat compared to LXA4. And here you see the differences in, in the other studies. What was every, evident from these studies is that if you, if you incubate the cells with the Staphylococcus aureus or condition medium with that, you get a very strong here activation of uh, uh, the 5 low pathway here in, 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 in these cells, but despite this very high activation of the 15 low pathway, you can only get very low formation um, of uh, SPMs. So uh, to sum this finding up, I mean, uh, firefly epoxygenase is, and that's known since many years, uh, is involved in the formation of, of leukotrienes here uh, together with FLAP. And, uh, if you have co-expression of 5-allow, uh, we find formation of the respective 
mono and dihydroxylated oxylipenes. Here are some, some examples of that. Uh, you find almost no trihydroxylated SPMs here. You, you, you see the list. And our conclusion then was that it is highly questionable that these extremely tiny amounts of trihydroxylated SPMs are formed in, vi in vivo at these sufficient amounts to mediate its resolution of inflammation. Then, uh, Hopefully I could convince you that besides these canonical functions of, of firefly poxinase, here uh, we have a non-canonical function that fivalo can interact uh, with transcription factors, can associate with uh, um, enhancer sites which are highly as, uh, acetylated and modulate the activity of other transcription factors and in that way regulate the transcription. So that was, um, I'm at the end. Finally, I would like to thank many co-workers which, uh, who, who contributed to, to our work. And also I would like to thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Dieter. That was great. I learned a huge amount there about the um, non-canonical role of the enzyme, which I didn't really know much about at all before. So thank you very much. That was really interesting. And I've got a question about about that. While people are posing questions in the Q&A or the chat, please go ahead and do that now. But I'll first of all ask a question if that's okay. And that's around the, the non-canonical function. You showed that very nicely that enzyme activity is required for this DNA binding and activation of gene expression. And I just wonder, what's the enzyme activity? You know, is, is there, is, is, is five heat somehow involved or, and is PLA2 then required or, you know, what's the mechanism of that? Do you know anything about that? I, I think that uh, it depends. I mean, it, part, if you look at COX-2 or the, the quinorinase, that activity was also, we could achieve or re recover the transcription activity with the catalytically inactive mutant. So this, uh, sorry, probably that was a misunderstanding. So uh -huh. in, in principle, a part of, of uh, this regulatory activity is independent of catalytic activity because that mutant was had no has no activity but um, regarding the adhesion molecules it's it's a bit different so here we see if you look at the different adhesion molecules we see a mixed effect so obviously here also catalytic activity plays a role but that could be related to the fact that that uh, yeah, these adhesion processes, they are regulated by the leukotriene B4. But for the yeah. uh, COX-2, it, it was independent of the catalytic activity. Yeah, because, I mean, there was also data showing an inhibitor of 5-LO inhibited the DNA binding. So it, that seemed to imply that catalytic <laughs> activity was somehow involved. Yeah, but, but yeah. right, uh, you're right, but it depends. Uh, so if you use, for example, siluton, you 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 do not uh, get this effect. So uh, yeah, you're, you're right. Uh, so this observation is restricted to a few inhibitors. So we don't know at the moment where they bind to exactly. Um, yeah, so it does not- There's lots more to find out. I think. Yeah, yeah, it does not work with every exactly. inhibitor. Um, yeah. So, uh, but for the quinorenines and, and the other, there we did not uh, observe, you don't, you don't need catalytic activity. Oh, okay. right. um, David Merriweather, are you able to unmute yourself? Uh, I am. Um, Go ahead. I, I think my question was in that same space. It was just, uh, <laughs> I, I'd seen the, the data on the, the effect of the inhibitor and was wondering about the role of the catalytic activity in, in mediating the the uh, you know the the suppressive effect of COX two expression, but I think um, your your mutant data. I think I asked the question before you presented your mm -hmm. your uh, your 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 mutant data, where you had no no catalytic activity, and yet it still uh, seemed to 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 have that function. So. Yeah, um, I mean, what we are currently doing is to do a screening for inhibitors of 5 allow which do not inhibit the canonical activity, but the, the uh, 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 this function as transcription factor, because that could be very interesting if you look at, for example, maybe uh, if you could suppress, for example, wind signaling in a leukocyte dependent manner, that could be very interesting, for example, for, for leukemia. Um, but uh, 
it's um, a tricky business. It's not so easy. Yeah. But if, but if the if the inhibitor is is here acting um, independently of of its inhibition of the catalytic activity, um, uh, what yeah. what is it doing there? I mean, why why is it seem to be as effective as it is? Well, uh, in principle, if you look at the catalytic activity, you need nanomolar, higher nanomolar concentrations. Um, if you want to affect the uh, transcriptional activity, you need a bit higher uh, to, to be effective. You go, uh, you saw that to be really uh, effective. You, at least in several, in some assays, you have to go to micromolar concentration. So we, we see a, a small shift in in the activity of the of the uh, inhibitor. At the moment, we don't know whether it, it maybe binds to uh, also a regulatory side of firefly poxinase uh, or uh, what's going on there because we were not able to crystallize it. Um, so we don't know where it binds or yeah, so it's it's hard to say. Okay, so moving on, um, Garrett Fitzgerald, you should be able to unmute yourself. Hi there, Dieter, very nice talk. Uh, Hello, Garrett, nice to see you. I think you've, uh, <clears throat> you've answered the question about the trihydroxylated SPMs, but I wondered with the mono and dihydroxylated products, <clears throat> when you look at their formation under uh, maximally advantageous circumstances, such as you described, with lots mm -hmm. of substrate and the hammer of ionophore, uh, how do those concentrations correspond to the ED50s for the receptors that have been suggested to be receptors for endogenous SPMs? Um, you refer now to the trihydroxylated one or the dihydroxylated one? Dihydroxylated. And I, I, I take the point on the trihydroxylated ones that yeah. the capacity to even form them is, is scant to non-existent. Yes. But I'm wondering about the dihydroxylated ones, whether the amounts formed have any relevance to activation of the receptors that have been suggested to be their receptors as endogenous ligands. Yeah, I, I, well... It's hard to say because uh, I'm not sure whether they have been really tested uh, on, on the receptor, like the 515-DIE, that's a, a um, compound which is known before. Um, so, uh, and also, I mean, yeah, for, for resolving D5, well, uh, as you as you said, it, it's hard to say at the moment because the the amounts are really low. I mean, sure. we consistently find them, but uh, I I don't want to 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 be so speculative to say whether it's sufficient to to do that. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Um, Tony Zhao, you can unmute yourself. Tony, are you there? Hello. Yeah, are you we can hear me? you. Go, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah we're in that Hello. Spot. It's, it's, I'm re very interested to learn. Uh, you major a couple uh, polyunsaturated fatty acid, including C24, 22, right? Did you ever measure anything longer than that? So after you impact the five locks or 15 locks, did you see any like saturated minor saturated fatty acid change? Um, you mean at, at longer incubation times? No, no, the, the fatty longer chain. Fatty uh, longer chains. Uh, well, we, we just uh, checked the DHA. We never tried uh, another one. No. Oh, okay, so this is, a, this is a, my first question. I was yeah. thinking once uh, because what I'm thinking because uh, the arachidonic assay, the, the stuff you work on, is a, is a major substrate for the lip lipoxygenase and the secular oxygenase, right? So that is a, that is, is a, a marker for many disease, right? Mm -hmm. And then if you inhibit that, I'm wondering if you can see any, you know, uh, particular saturated fatty acid change or not. The second question I want to ask you, I saw you, you use the vitamin D3 to differentiate the the metal max six. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. Could you tell me a little bit about the purpose of that, or if you use the vitamin D three to just to differentiate the metal side to macrophage? Did you ever try other stuff other than vitamin three? Uh, 
And yeah, we, we we tried almost all, which is now to induce maturation of of, of leukemic cells. So um, the combination of vitamin D three and TGF beta is is um, the most effective one. So five lipoxinase is a direct vitamin D response gene, and uh, if you if you grow the cells, like regardless whether it's THB1 or HL60 or a monomax 6 cell or whatever kind of human leukemic cell line, usually uh, if they are undifferentiated, they don't express 5 low or very at very low amounts or very variable amounts. So you have to differentiate them and then you get a really strong upregulation. So so that's the background why we, we differentiated the monomax 6 cells um, so then they, that they express 5 low. Okay. Thank, thank you, um, Tony. So, uh, okay. last yeah. question, I think, probably from Nick Flamand. Nick, you can unmute yourself there. Thank you, Valerie. Hi, Dieter. Thank you very Hi, much. Hi, Nicholas. <laughs> thank you very much for your uh, very interesting presentation. I have two questions. Uh, one regarding the non canonical effects of uh, 5LO, and you've showed that 5LO was very important for, for COX 2 expression. However, cyclic AMP does not really induce COX-2 expression in leukocytes, uh, yet it should phosphorylate 5-LO and keep it in the cytosol. Mm -hmm. Do you have any idea why? And basically, is 5-LO not phosphorylated in leukocytes? Well, um, hard to say. Uh, I at least, I mean, as far as I know, in the undifferentiated cells, they are not, not phosphorylated or, I mean, you have also done a lot of studies with that one. Um, did you see phosphorylation in, in, uh, at, uh, without stimulation? At no. Serine? No. Uh, not, no. No. So it seems to work in your particular model, but that may not apply to uh, human leukocytes. Yeah. Uh, also for the uh, 15 heat and 17 HDHA experiments, uh, have you compared the uh, these compounds with their hydroperoxides? And my guess is that they might work better by changing the redox sta status of 5-LO. Uh, yeah, we did not do that. Um, so we just used the reduced uh, compounds in the in, in in the neutrophil studies, but I think uh, with a purified enzyme that was done by Ted Holman's group, he compared the uh, alcohol with the with the um, uh, peroxide, and it, it was rather, at least for the purified enzyme, it was rather similar. So the the hydroperoxides were converted a bit better, but it was not such a strong difference. <laughs> I mean, if, if you look that at the Cellular compartment. I mean, our experience is that the hydroperoxides they're re reduced very fast. So um, usually, I mean, if you look, if you think about transcellular biosynthesis, I'm I'm not sure whether you, you have intact hydroperoxides, but uh, most probably they are rapidly reduced by the glutathione peroxidase to to the corresponding alcohol. Yeah. Okay, thanks, Nick. So, I mean, we are coming to the end, but I think we'll take one last question because Miguel posted one there and I can't say no to Miguel. So, Miguel, you can unmute yourself and speak. I think I already unmuted myself. Oh, well, can you, you have. Can you hear me? Okay. We can. Uh, uh, thank you, Dieter. That was fascinating. And 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 I, I like Val said, I learned a lot too. So I just have a very simple question and you might have alluded to it and I may have missed it. So I apologize if mm -hmm. that's the case. And for the canonical, non-canonical function of 5LO, is FLAP needed at all? Have you tested that? Hmm. <laughs> we, we never knocked out FLAP. So uh, I can't give you a direct uh, answer, answer to that. Uh, Hard, hard to say. Um, we should have knocked it out. Yeah, right. Yeah, and, there and, are very good there are very good inhibitors as well. So. Yeah, but uh, I think with the inhibitor, I think we, we with the inhibitor we tried that. Um, it it had no effect. So we we used MK eight eight six and it did not do anything. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. 
Okay, well, I think we've come to the end of our questions, Dieter. It just remains for me to say thank you very much again for an excellent webinar, and I look forward to seeing everybody another month from now for our next um, webinar in the series. So thank you again. Um, goodbye. Goodbye. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. <laughs>